Thanks again. Uh, thank you for that pretty warm reception. Uh, the, uh, this is great to be back here. Um, you know, it was uh, March of uh, 2012 when I, I addressed this room and the multi-chamber group then. Uh, was, was anyone who was in this room now there for that, for that one? Boy, a lot of, yeah, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, I'm, there's a lot of people that were out of that speech, and I'm, I'm actually kind of afraid of that because I came out here and I did talk, talk about our three main goals. Uh, and, but, but unfortunately, uh, as I talked about those goals and talked about so many other things, I was quoted as pointing to the uh, rising young stars on the Chicago Cubs, which included Brian Lahair and Ian Stewart. Now, um, not only did Brian Lahair and Ian Stewart not have great years as Cubs, it was both their final years in Major League Baseball. <laughs> and uh, now Brian went on and played a little bit in Japan, and I think he's still in the independent league somewhere. And I think I think Ian came back, and uh, I think he made got a few bats a couple years ago. But um, but David Jesus, who I apparently also mentioned that day, is now an announcer with uh, the Comcast Sportsnet. So anyway, it wasn't uh, you know my my predictions of uh, you know, what was gonna happen that season weren't that great. And in fact, we did go on to lose 101 games that year. So, um, so I'm not so sure my, my luck for coming to this event is there. But, but, you know, but the fact is, um, you know, obviously several things have changed. You know, we announced our, our, our three main goals and um, you know, we've made a lot of progress and I'll talk about that. But obviously I, I think the, uh, the, the thing that's probably changed the most is we have this ring now that I'm going to put on. So anyway, I, I will, uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to update everyone on all the, the, the accomplishments we've had over the last few years and talk about our, our three main goals, um, which are still the same goals. Now, I might have a few years ago said win a World Series. Now we talk about winning the World Series. Um, and of course, to preserve, preserve and improve the park and to be a good neighbor. So. I'm gonna kind of take those in reverse order and I'll go through some of the things we've done and then we'll have time for questions. So, um, so be a good neighbor. That's one of the ones that I, I said on the very first day uh, that we bought the club. And, and honestly, I didn't really know exactly what that was gonna mean. Um, one of the things that we really focused on was thinking of the term neighbor in terms of what's around the ballpark. Um, I, I just, I think a couple people at my table for lunch used to live in Wrigleyville. I'm sure many people in this room used to live in Wrigleyville. Um, but, you know, we really wanted to uh, do something that was good for the neighborhood. Uh, as anyone that, um, as anyone knows, you know, during the winter, there isn't a whole bunch of activity outside of Wrigley Field. You know, during the summer, there's, I mean, it, there's a lot of action, particularly on the game days, uh, a lot of sports bars. But in the winter, you know, Wrigley Field didn't look very good and there really wasn't much activity. So anyway, we did a lot of things. First of all, we opened a new, a new uh, park outside, a little plaza. If anyone's been to the game, they know they can take their, take their kids out there and throw the baseball around a little bit during the game. You can still watch on a big screen TV. Just kind of lets the park breathe a little bit. And at that park, we've also done some other things for the neighbors, including, and you can see up here in the, middles, in the, the middle upper shot, that's a, uh, um, a movie night. We had people come out to, to watch Blues Brothers and other things, and they all the movie nights sold out. Just the uh, just places for neighbors to come on a weeknight. We had pop jets, you know, for little kids. And one of my favorite things last summer was to look out my window and see little kids running through our uh, our little sprinkler system outside. We did uh, a fitness series, and this is a, a photo up there of people on yoga mats. We did, in addition to yoga mats, different cross training, different, different exercising things. It was um, a big success for neighbors. Um, we did a uh, farmer's market, and we did, uh, which was very successful, and we also did uh, an ice rink, which uh, our little winter market, over 250,000 people came to over the course of about four weeks, and, uh, and over 25,000 people skated. So we're very excited about doing something that's really nice for our neighbor neighbors. But we also define ourselves as being good neighbor to the city of Chicago. And uh, one of the things that was, was um, uh, apparent when I got to the Cubs was that, you know, while we gave money to local causes, we didn't really think of ourselves as the Chicago Cubs, we were the, the Wrigleyville Cubs. So we, uh, we refocused ourselves and reached out to do um, 
uh, literally dozens of projects all throughout the city that entail millions of dollars. This is just a map uh, of some of them. We've also done several projects throughout the suburbs in various places, particularly neighborhoods that, that need more attention and have less, have less uh, financial resources. Um, so, you know, and, there, and there's, there's, a, there's several, maybe a dozen of those projects that we've done also, including all sorts of summer camps and, and, uh, and other things we've done around the neighborhood. Uh, but, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of over the last few years is that not only have the Cubs become by far the most uh, charitable sports team in Chicago, we think we're the most, the, one of the, if not the most, one of the most charitable sports teams in all of sports. We know that in baseball we've been chasing the Red Sox for several years, um, and now we've, we've, uh, we've, been, we've kind of caught up to them and maybe passed them this year. And... Um, and last year, Cubs Charities raised over $10 million, which, um, and, and for those of you in the room that have your own charities, and I'm sure all of you are very civic-minded, uh, it's just a lot of work, and it's a, that's, a lot of, that's, a, that's a lot of success. We're very, very proud of it. So, so Cubs Charities and, and being a good neighbor, I think we've really come a long way toward uh, realizing our potential and uh, achieving the goal that, uh, that we laid out here six years ago. And it's not just money, too. We also have uh, associates who dedicated over 3,400 hours of their time last year. Uh, everyone in here, almost everyone in here is a business person of one sort or another. You know, one of the things that is, uh, uh, you know, terrific about the younger generation of, of workers that we have coming through is everybody's a volunteer. It's just, it's, it's something that is, um, Kind of in the DNA, and we were when we were young. It was like, hey, you worked, you paid your rent, and that was it. You know, you had to. Work, you know, and that was the most important thing. Uh, now we have a lot of young associates who donate their time all over the city to a variety of projects, and that added up to um, over 3,400 hours of community service last year from our associates alone. So we're very proud of the, the work they put in. Um, you know, and and we also do other things for our neighborhood. Um, you know, one of the things that's a big problem throughout the city, but even in, even near Wrigley. Is, um, is crime, uh, and so when we would do focus groups, and we're, you know, I, I was just fo doing focus groups with our neighbors, trying to figure out what, you know, what kind of things we should put in the neighborhood, or what kind, of, what kind of amenities they need, or what's missing, and I'd say, hey, what, what do you guys think about a new hotel? And they'd say, that's great, but we're worried about crime in schools. And I'd say, well, what if this new hotel had a great bar on top? They'd be like, yeah, it's great, but crime in schools is what we care about. So. Um, so two of the things we really focused on in the last couple of years, we gave a million dollars to the, uh, worked with the city of Chicago to put a million dollars in for new security cameras throughout the neighborhood, which, um, uh, which, is, which is making everyone feel a little better. We put a lot of money into new patrols around the neighborhood. And, um, and you know, I think that overall we've, uh, we've really doubled the, uh, the amount of effort we put into making Wrigley a safe neighborhood as well as a great neighborhood. And on top of that, We've, um, you know, we gave about a half million dollars last year to our local schools. So we listen to our locals, lo our local neighbors as carefully as we can and do everything we can to make the neighborhood around Wrigley um, safe, secure, and uh, keep the people who have their kids in school. So, so I think we've done a pretty good job on goal number three. Goal number two was to preserve and improve Wrigley Field. Um, Wrigley Field, as everyone in this room knows, was built in 1914. Uh, it was built by a man named Charles Wigman, not for the Cubs, but for a, for a, uh, a team that was in a, a, a different league. And he built it in 10 weeks for $250,000. So uh, I always kind of fantasize, I'd like to go back and meet Mr. Wigman and tell him that we're about to finish putting in $750 million into his $250,000 ballpark. But... Um, you know, when, and when you include what we've done outside the park, the family has put about a billion dollars of private investment uh, into the ballpark and the neighborhood. And, and everyone in this room is a development person. You're on the Chamber of Commerce. You know how hard that is to get people to invest in your neighborhoods and, and your business people. And um, you just know that the, uh, that's a pretty substantial contribution to the economy of our neighborhood and our city, uh, creating thousands of jobs. and, and and of course, uh, we're also really good at creating tax revenue. So anyway, so in terms of preserving and improving Wrigley Field, the, uh, is my mic not working? Is that gonna work better? 
Sorry, so, so people in the back didn't hear any of that? I, I, I turned it on. It's green. I'll take this one off now. So anyway, from the top. Uh, so anyway, we've done a lot to improve the, uh, preserve the Wrigley Field, obviously the ballpark. Um, and just a few pictures of some of the things we've done. In the uh, upper right here, we have the, uh, the new Players Clubhouse. Uh, and, and I probably made the joke back in 2012 how bad our clubhouse was. It was so bad that when a player wanted to get loose to go into the game, uh, you know, go into like pinch hit, instead of going to a batting tunnel where he could see live pitching or maybe have a pitching machine throw baseballs at him, uh, he would go to the clubhouse and he would take out a tee, like our little kids use in t-ball, set the tee on the ground, put a ball on the tee, and before he was able to swing the bat to hit the ball to get loose, he would have to go lower a net and a board so when he did hit the ball, it wouldn't break the television. <laughs> and that was Major League Baseball Clubhouse for us. So that was, that was, that was uh, we had the worst clubhouse in baseball. Now, um, a few years later, we have the best. And we're, it truly is the best. It's, um, it's something the players appreciate. Um, we rebuilt the, the bleachers, um, obviously. We've put in, uh, you know, we rebuilt the bleachers. The other thing that we did that, um, and you kind of see a little bit in that picture. I wish I had a better photo. Like the, um, if anyone's walked around the outside of the ballpark, not just the bleachers, but the whole ballpark, you know, we went back to 1935. And we, we looked at all the years of Wrigley Field, and we determined that 1935 was the year that Wrigley looked the best. And the Wrigley family, who, bought, who took control of the team in about 1920, they, um, they put a lot of money, in, and William Wrigley was really committed to making Wrigley Field the best ballpark in baseball. And, um, and they, they really made it beautiful. And, and about 1935 was probably when it was at its most beautiful. So as you walk around the park, you'll see that we brought back a lot of the decorative, uh, decorative wrought iron they had. Um, you know, we brought back... Uh, exposed brick, some of the terracotta tiles, because all those beautiful features over time had been removed and replaced by basically a chain link fence or like precast concrete. So um, it's, we're not done yet. We have one more year of work to do, but I hope everyone that comes to the ballpark notices just how beautiful Wrigley Field is becoming again, because we're very proud of that. Um, obviously, uh, we put in the uh, scoreboards, the video boards. Um, which, um, you know, a lot of people had a lot of drama over this, uh, you know, a few years back. But as we surveyed people that come to the ballpark each and every year, it was just obvious that it was the amenity that people missed the most. Um, and so when we, uh, when we got the, the go-ahead to do the renovation of the park, we put up the scoreboards in right and in left. And it, they've been a huge success. And hopefully everyone here understands that and sees that we, you know, we, we, uh, we do it tastefully. We try to make it feel like it's part of the game and not a distraction. We don't do a lot of the more obnoxious things other teams do with their scoreboards. And so um, hopefully everyone sees it as an additive thing. In fact, the first year we had them, I, I don't, what year that would have been 2014 or something. The first year we had them, I, a guy ran up to me and said, Rick, it's you ruined this ballpark with those video boards. And I'm like, brother, it's July 18th, and you're the first person that's complained. <laughs> Maybe it's you. <laughs> so anyway, the, uh, we, uh, we've had great success with the, with the video boards. Obviously, we're always adding, we, uh, we're adding uh, more amenities. This year, we'll have more, um, you know, we've, we've always, we've done more, uh, like, uh, you know, food and beverage, try to improve the experience. I think we, you know, we, because of the lack of kitchens and, and the complications in preparation, it was very difficult to serve great food at Wrigley, but we've come a very far way in a very short period of time. And, um, you know, and I think that uh, the new concessions, uh, which uh, we've opened and we'll open some more this year, are serving a much, much higher quality of food, and we've mixed in a bunch of different variety. So um, whether you're looking for kind of your old-fashioned hot dog, which is, uh, you know, still great. Um, there's a lot more variety than ever. And, um, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep moving forward on all that stuff. Now, Wrigley Field is still under construction. And this is a photo from just a couple days ago. So if, um, if I have bags under my eyes, it's because I'm not sleeping. And um, 
And in this photo, there's something like 30 vehicles on the park, uh, on the grass, on the field. And um, what we're doing here is we're, we're building in, in addition to replacing pretty much all the steel at Wrigley Field, of the $750 million, the vast majority of it is steel, concrete, electrical, plumbing, and it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's a rehab. But there are, we are building in features. Um, we're building in some higher, um, some, you know, some like, uh, some, some nicer clubs. And, and what you're seeing here is both on the first base and third base side, we, uh, we dug down and we dug basically 28 foot holes underneath the grandstand to put in a, a club for the people that sit on the first base side, a club for the people that sit on the third base side. And then this year, people sit right behind home plate are gonna have a, a club to go to. So like what every other ballpark in baseball has is places where you can get out of the rain or, or go get a beer very quickly or, or, or do a shorter uh, restroom line. And so we have those coming online over time. Next year, um, we'll have uh, the two first and third base club open, and then we'll also have one in the upper deck, which I'm really excited about. But um, the other day, uh, there was over 450 construction workers at Wrigley Field, which, um, which is very, very frightening. It's like an anthill, uh, but I'm, I'm really, I'm pretty scared. But, but fortunately, we open on the road in Miami, so we have an extra 10 days to get everything ready for, uh, for April 9th. So, but, so some of the things you're gonna see this year as you get back, and these are some photos, some recent photos. Um, you know, we're building in uh, new concession stands. We are uh, improving the Wi-Fi at, uh, at Wrigley Field, um, which, yeah, that's a big one. Well, at one point in, in 2016, it was like the, like the, there was some like social media stat, like it was the most, the, the biggest location that social media was coming from or something like the place that people posted the most from for uh, for a few weeks in that that playoff run so um, and we realized that everyone wants to send a photo of themselves at Wrigley Field and we shouldn't discourage that so we've got more Wi-Fi coming and more DAS and Wi-Fi it'll it's not going to 100% be ready all on April 9th but it'll be you know, over the course of the uh, summer uh, the lower left hand corner here we are building a um, uh, it's what they call in other ballparks an elevator. And um, so obviously in 1914, there wasn't even an upper deck. So they didn't really plan on elevators. So um, we did, we, over the years, they built a few in, but now we got a few more coming online. So we'll be able to uh, move people in and out uh, a little more efficiently. And it's really designed for people with uh, special needs for the most part, or, or people that have trouble getting around. But for those people that are coming back, we are definitely gonna have um, a better situation for them going forward. So as you come back to Wrigley this year, you will, um, you will, you know, you'll sense some improvements and, um, and, and, and know that you'll have a, uh, some more options for food and, and better connectivity. But, you know, one of the things I've always said is we don't wanna change the way Wrigley Field looks. Um, you know, when people get to their seat at Wrigley Field, they are in their happy place. And we want them to continue to feel like that's, that's their special place. And we want to do nothing that would ever um, uh, change the way you feel about Wrigley Field because it is the ballpark that maybe your great-grandfather went to and would still recognize. So um, we don't want to change anything along those lines. Now, outside, we're willing to change a few things. Um, one of the things that we're opening this year is a hotel, and um, it's, it's, it's a very cool hotel. It's kind of a hip urban kind of vibe, and um, now uh, I know every one of the chambers here have their own um, hotels and accommodations in your own areas, but if you have someone that's so unfortunate as to have to stay in the city of Chicago next year, um, <laughs> please tell them about the hotel at Wrigley Field. Uh, it's going to be gorgeous, and not only will it be cool and, and kind of hip and have like a great vibe to it, it's also going to have great restaurants. Um, you know, like, uh, like one of the things that, that we realized early on was that, you know, the area around Wrigley Field does kind of become relatively inert in the winter, not a lot going on. And so we wanted to bring people in, and how do you bring people in on non-game days? Well, you know, we built the plaza where people can come and hang out and go skate or whatever they're going to do. Um, but we also want to bring in people with food. And so we went out to all the great restaurant groups in Chicago, and, um, and, they're, and they're listed on here. The, the, um, you know, we have a, uh, a Big Star Taco, which is like a, kind of a really hip uh, uh, Wicker Park restaurant that will have a version 
um, right there. We'll have a smoked daddy, which is kind of a high end of barbecue. We have Matthias Murgis, who's a, uh, an acclaimed uh, celebrity chef who was the executive chef at Charlie Trotter's for 17 years to uh, open a restaurant called Mordecai, which will be fun and funky. Um, we'll have uh, a West Town Bakery, which is an award-winning bakery. And then, um, and then the Boca Group is opening a, uh, a restaurant at, at the end of the hotel. So there'll be, uh, which will be a, a very, a little more high-end, a nicer place. So, so in addition to having, you know, things people can do, Outside, you know, uh, outside the park, we're going to think places for people to eat, and we're very excited about all this. And that's all going to open April 9th. So, um, so it, to the extent that uh, you guys want to come down a little early before the game and grab a bite, there'll be other options for you, or stay after the game and grab a bite, there'll be options for you. And um, and then, since there's a large commute, you know, for some of the folks here, you know, stay the night. You know, what the heck? Grab a hotel room. <laughs> so. Um, but you know, and we're all, once again, since we're all business people, we're all commerce people here, the, um, you know, just the, the economics of what we've done, I think, has been pretty astounding. You know, when, when you talk about, you know, close to a billion dollars of development, you know, a lot of that is steel, but the other biggest cost is wage. Um, we've spent over $325 million in wages throughout the project, um, you know, and had more than a thousand different construction jobs coming through. Um, you know, really is a, a great support to the local economy. Um, we had more than um, uh, 50 million of those of our uh, 50 million dollars worth of contracts awarded to um, to diverse firms, or um, uh, and about 28 million dollars awarded um, to go. Yeah, so we'll end up having a, a large so that a large amount of our uh, dollars going to diverse and women-owned firms, and we also have about 38 percent of our workers that would be women or or minorities. So I think that we've really walked the walk. It's something we promised the city we'd be sensitive to um, when we started the project, and I think we've really delivered. And um, like I said, and one of the things that it really does help is, you know, we do pay. Um, you know, the the uh, you know the, this not only does it just create jobs with the, the development itself, we pay an incredible amount of taxes to the city of Chicago, which I'm happy for them, not so happy for me some days, but. Um, <laughs> But we pay more than twice the taxes of the second highest tax team in baseball. So like we, um, we definitely contribute to our economy in multiple ways. So anyway, so that the project keeps going. Once again, April 9th is home opener. All this stuff should pretty much be ready except for one of the restaurants. So hopefully everyone here will get a chance to come use it and, um, and maybe spend the night. So anyway, <laughs> so that's, that's the, uh, the second goal. Now, the first goal has always been to win the World Series. And um, yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, uh, the fact is that um, when we were here in 2012, my story would have been just be patient. It's going to take some time. We're building, um, we're building the, the right facilities. We're bringing in the right leadership in baseball. We're going to start from the bottom up and draft good young players and develop them over time, and, and that's exactly what we did. And, um, you know, there was a little bit of angst. You know, obviously not every uh, fan was on board. There were times where I'd be walking through the park, which I walk through the park every game, and uh, guys would come up and be like, all right, Rick, it's you're ruining this whole thing. And I'd be like, brother, like, what, which is your favorite championship, 1907 or 1908? <laughs> what, what exactly are you clicking on to that, that we can't change? So, so uh, but I think one of the things that I, I, um, that I think we did well was we, I think we were pretty honest, except for that part about telling you to believe in the Brian LaHare era. I'm, over, I'm sorry about that. But like, but generally speaking, like, you know, we, we told the story as it was, you know, we're going to build facilities. We built New Dominican. We built New Spring Training. We redid Wrigley Field. We drafted the right, we drafted and built and developed our own players. So in 2016, and here's a photo from that World Series win, we were the youngest team in the history of the World Series. So we were a very young team that, that came through and obviously uh, led us through a, a really exciting 2016. And, um, and of course, uh, you know, everybody got a chance to celebrate. Um, let me go to the next slide. The uh, pretty, pretty amazing, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 you know, just the, the number of people that, thankfully we were in Cleveland, because if we were in Chicago and a million people came to stand outside Wrigley Field, the people inside Wrigley wouldn't be able to get out. <laughs> so, so it all worked out pretty well. And actually, did anybody, anybody get to that game seven? Anybody in here? 
Oh yeah, quite a few. So it was per really a perfect setup for us in the sense that it was in Cleveland, which isn't too far away. And um, honestly, tickets weren't as hard to get as people might imagine um, because Cleveland uh, doesn't have a big season ticket holder base. So there was a lot of tickets moving around. And um, so, and, and if you were there, you remember, it seemed it was like a pretty good Cub contingent there. I mean, I don't know about half, but certainly huge uh, c group of Cub people in, in Cleveland. And this is what happened the night back in Chicago, the photo outside Wrigley. And then, of course, Friday morning, we did the parade. Um, now, the parade was pretty crazy. Um, it, and they, they say, uh, you know, it was a pretty big crowd. And so there's like, I don't know how many people, 800, 900 people here today. So. Um, if I seem a little nervous talking to a crowd of this size, it's because I'm, I'm now used to talking to crowds of over two million. <laughs> um, so the, uh, and they said, actually they said it was, I forget the crazy, it was crazy talk numbers, but, um, but no matter how you slice the numbers, it was the largest gathering of humanity in the history of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> And, uh, and, and it was just crazy. All, I mean, every, every street from where we left at Wrigley all the way down to Grant Park was jammed. And it was a beautiful Friday. I'm sure, sure many of you were there or, or were downtown and, and watched it go by or whatever. It was, it was a beautiful day, um, a beautiful experience, and a great way to finish up a really magical season. So um, uh, hopefully we will do more parades in the near future, and hopefully they'll be as nice as this one. But, you know, away from 2016, we have a lot of things to be excited about, like the fact is, over the last three years, we've won more games than any team in baseball. We've won more playoff games than any team in baseball. And we've made it to the National League Championship Series three years in a row. Um, and obviously, uh, last year it didn't turn out like we wanted. We lost to the Dodgers. But making it to the NLCS three years in a row is a pretty remarkable accomplishment. And in fact, winning the World Series and then getting back to the NLCS is a really rare accomplishment. In fact, since the Yankees had their three-peat in 99 through 01, only one team has gone back to the World Series after winning it. In fact, only one team's only won their division the next year. So there is something to the World Series hangover that they talked about. I mean, at least on paper, it's, it's unlikely these teams who had just won would fall as far as they do, typically. But, um, but they did. And last year, what you saw for us was a, a, we kind of stumbled out of the gate. You know, we didn't, we didn't have... Um, we didn't have our A game going into April and May and June. And then once we got to the All-Star break um, and kind of turned it around and had a great second half. In fact, we had the best second half record, except for the Cleveland Indians, of, uh, of anyone in the league. So, and we had a pretty good year. I mean, it, in terms of the stats, like, you know, we had the fourth best rotation. Well, we had the seventh best starting ERA in baseball, fourth in the National League. We had, like, the, uh, the, like the maybe sixth best um, uh, ERA in the, in the bullpen, and then we scored 822 runs, which actually more runs than we scored in 2016, which I, I think was first. I kind of forget, but like the um, we had we had a pretty good we had a pretty good season in terms of a lot of the stats. You know, we had the highest on base percentage in the National League, and we had for the first time in the history of baseball, we had five players under the age of 25 hit. 20 home runs, so I'm not sure where that stuff came from. But anyway, um, so we had a pretty good year. The second half, of course, better than the first half. Made it back to that incredibly dramatic game in Washington that almost killed me. Um, and, uh, and of course, didn't quite deliver against the, uh, the Dodgers. But what, that, what we still have going into this year is that same young core of great players, that same team that was uh, the youngest lineup in the history of the World Series. I think now we're the seventh youngest team in baseball, so we're aging slightly. But, um, but you look around our infield, and it's pretty amazing when you have the Rizzo's and Bryant's and Javi and Schwarber and, and Wilson Contreras, and, and you look, you know, maybe Ian Happ should be on this, on this, on this slide and a few other guys, Albert Almora. But, but we still have that good young core. And if you remember what we talked about a few years ago, it was always about build the good core of homegrown players and then add to them. And one of the ways we've added to them, of course, is our rotation. Um, we have three guys coming back from last year's rotation, um, Quintana, Hendricks, and Lester. I guess we could put Montgomery on here. He's made several starts. But um, none of these guys were homegrown. Uh, Jose Quintana came from the White Sox in the middle of last year in a trade for a highly regarded prospect. 
Kyle Hendricks was in the Ryan Dempster trade uh, a few years ago. And um, in fact, Ryan Dempster loves to point out what a contributor he was to the World Series <laughs> by uh, allowing himself to be traded for Kyle Hendricks. Uh, and then John Lester, of course, um, really a, uh, a, an inflection point in our development was John Lester in the set to, the set, in the, to the extent that he was really the first high profile free agent to trust us, trust Theo, and trust the organization to, to uh, be on the right track. And when John came in before the 2015 season, um, it kind of set the tone that the team was no longer going to be uh, happy with um, developing players, we're going to only be happy with winning. So, um, so these three guys are coming back for our rotation, which is great. But we've added pitchers, we've added some arms this year. Um, Tyler Chatwood will be our fifth starter. Um, Tyler Chatwood is uh, a player who not a lot of people know well because he played in Colorado, which is uh, a little bit smaller market, um, not a lot, don't get quite as much attention, but, and his ERA isn't that eye-popping. Uh, but when he pitches on the road away from the very hitter-friendly park in Colorado, over the last three years, he has one of the lowest road ERAs in the league. And he's right up there with like, Strasburg and, and the big stars. So we're hoping that he will be a, a major contributor. And he was a highly sought-after pitcher this offseason that we signed right away. Um, in the bullpen, uh, we have Brandon Morrow and Steve Ciszek coming in. Brandon Morrow was, of course, the setup man for the Dodgers, who, who uh, made, made our guys look pretty bad in the, in the NLCS last year. Um, so now he's on our team. Um, you know, we think that he's got uh, the potential to be a really, uh, really excellent closer. Um, obviously, Shishek is a, uh, a guy who was a closer, who's got great stuff, late inning kind of stuff. He, I think he had 39 saves for the Marlins just a couple years ago. Uh, professional, uh, highly regarded bullpen arm. We also have a pretty good bullpen coming back. I mean, everyone remembers Carl Edwards and, and, uh, and, and Dunsing and Strope is one of the better bullpen arms. So we, we've got more depth in our bullpen ever. And, um, and, it, and so we should be very confident about our late innings. But on top of that, we also have um, the biggest free agent of the offseason. <laughs> like, for um, not a lot of people know a lot about you, Darvish. He spent most of his career in the American League until, until last year when he was a Dodger. But, um, but he has an, just an incredible career. And in fact, a little known stat is amongst starters with more than 100 starts, uh, he has the highest strikeout per nine inning ratio of anyone in the history of baseball. And um, so, you know, Darvish is um, a, uh, a guy with multiple pitches. He's a very thoughtful, he's a smart pitcher with great stuff, um, 31 years old. We signed him on a six-year, $126 million deal. We really feel that um, with Darvish in the, uh, did everyone just gasp at $126 million? <laughs> You know, it's a weird thing about my job now. Like, you know, you just say that. You don't even think, what, I, what does that mean? Ah, it's $126 million, whatever. Uh, you know, it's like <laughs> we get kind of immune to it. But um, anyhow, uh, $126 million. I think. All right. I'm okay. I'm going to get through it. So, um, but the fact is that, uh, you know, uh, you know with, with the guys that we brought back from last year, you know, the, you know, the leadership of, um, you know, the, the, the leadership of John Lester, this, you know, the, the great stuff and the great style of Kyle Hendricks, the consistency of, of Quintana, um, Chatwood is going to be a player that's really good. And then you throw in you Darvish. I think we've had, we have the best rotation that the Cubs have had in a very long time. And if all these guys stay healthy and you throw in Mike Montgomery to help give them a day off here or there, um, I think we really have uh, the chance to have the best rotation in baseball. So, um, so we're very excited about our prospects this year. And, and um, you know, so the journey continues. You know, we're, we're, uh, we've got the one ring and I wanna come back in six years with a few more on this hand. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we've done the things we have to do to be what we believe is the, you know, one of, if not the best organization in baseball. We have a great young core. We have a good starting pitching. We have a terrific baseball leadership with Theo. We have terrific business leadership with Crane, Crane Kenny, our team president. And, um, you know, we feel like this could be another one of those really, really exciting years. So um, with that, um, I will gladly open it up for easy questions. <laughs> Thank you.
we got a mic. Uh, there's a microphone coming around. Thank you, Tom. Baseball is a great game, uh, but it's also business. I was wondering if you could talk about the, the, the effects of, of the business aspects of baseball on what's been going on with free agency. With free agency? Um, well, this is a pretty unique year for free agency. For people that are watching, uh, watching what happens in the, in the, in the, in the, in the winter here, um, the, the fact is that next year's free agent class is dramatic. Like, really good young players, Bryce Harper, Manny Machado, some pitchers. Um, and this year's free agent class is okay. And I don't think there's ever been a year where more teams are thinking, let's save my resources till next year. And I think that's, that's probably the biggest thing that's happening right now. I mean, once you spend money on a player, you're done. These are all fully guaranteed contracts. So, and you, you don't get to spend that dollar again. So I think teams are being very, very careful about how they're spending this offseason in advance of next offseason. And, you know, I think there's... Um, uh, you know, there's obviously high-profile players like Jake Arrieta who still haven't signed yet. And, um, and I'm not sure how that gets resolved, but, but I do know that um, there's a, a lot of teams kind of keeping dry powder for next year. I think the second thing that's really a big driver of this free agency is that I think teams are really just trying to build their own programs. Um, you know, the fact is that, you know, developing your own talent, having guys that are coming up through the system, controlling them for a, a fair number of years at a, at a reasonable price is the way that the, the Cubs, the way that the Astros, and the way other teams are, have been successful. So I think teams are really focused on, you know, the, in, the internal development. I think a third factor is, um, you know, typically every offseason there's a team or two that gets a new television deal. Like a team will get a new RSN arrangement. Like, you know, a lot of teams make, every team makes money off there. Like our version is Comcast Sportsnet, but you know, there's Fox Sports St. Louis or whatever. And those, te those deals have been getting renewed at much higher levels. So a lot of fresh cash has come in at the team level. The last couple of years there really hasn't been new deals. So I think there's a number of factors that go into this being a slower free agency year than ever. Um, but I'm pretty confident next year uh, that when Bryce Harper and Manny Machado are up there, uh, team owners will be just as foolish and self-destructive as they've ever been. <laughs> Next question. First of all, thank you very much. We really appreciate what you're doing for us. You said you, you have a nice young nucleus of players uh, playing through right now. In your minor league system, where, where, what level are there better players who expect to be potential major leaders? Oh, in our, in our minors? Um, well, you know, it's interesting, like, it's not, the way, and everyone knows, kind of, like, there's minors, there's, there's, like, summer league ball, there's, like, a short season that you do with the guys in, in um, so you have, like, a, a, like, a short season league, then you have A, double A, triple A, and um, it's not always the case that your very best prospects are at triple A, because um, those are the guys, a lot of those guys are more veterans, and they're ready to be plugged and played up at, up at the major league level if you need them. So um, a lot of times, like, the guys with the higher ceiling are still working through A-ball or double A-ball. Um, you know, we have, we have some pretty good pitching prospects coming through, like a guy named, a guy named Azale that everyone's got their eye on and, and several others. You know, the, um, uh, unfortunately, we, we don't have the highest rated farm system anymore, in large part because we traded some of the higher ceiling prospects for players that helped us. I mean, Glebar Torres was, a, was an up-and-coming sh Venezuelan shortstop we traded to get our role is Chapman, and he was the key piece in the Chapman deal, and, and obviously that worked out pretty well, so you, you just you got to be happy with it. And then last year, Eloy Jimenez, we traded to the White Sox for, for, um, for Jose Quintana, and so, um, and that worked out okay for us because it got us, got us winning again and got us back in the playoffs. But it is a focus, particularly for our guys focusing on developing more pitching. We've been relatively successful with our hitters. We've been able to find guys that we can develop into productive major league hitters. We've been less successful at drafting and developing pitchers, particularly starting pitchers. You know, we have um, a couple guys. Jen Ho Sang is going to be in Iowa. He had, a, he had a start last year. He's a young, a young pitcher from Taiwan who has potential. There's a few more, but, but um, you know, I think this year, like the guys that are on that opening day roster are going to be the primary contributors, and I don't see... Um, we don't really see anyone coming from the minors to help out that much this year. What do you think the strongest aspect of the team is this year? Is it the infield, the depth, the rotation, or like the bullpen? 
Well, I think the strongest aspect of fashion in this room is right there. So, um, you know, it's, I don't know, like, I don't, I don't see a weakness in any of those, any of those positions, uh, any of those, uh, you know, any of those functions of our game. I mean, we had, we, we um, were a very high scoring team last year. We have a new hitting coach, which should help us a little bit. I think one of the things that we were really good at last year was when we had a, when we had a pitcher with a good matchup versus us, we scored a lot of runs. Where we were less successful was when we had a high quality pitcher and uh, you know, we didn't stick to the plan like we could have. And I think that Chili Davis will help us as a, as a hitting coach. So I think we're gonna score more runs this year, honestly. Um, I think our, every one of our players has got one more year of experience. Um, you know, typically players get better until they're around 29 or 30 and we're still pretty young. So um, I could see us scoring more runs this year easily. I could also see uh, us having a better starters ERA. We were seventh in, in, in the entire league in starters ERA and a little over four. Um, and that was with, um, you know, uh, starting the year with Brett Anderson in our rotation and, and uh, you know, and John Lackey was solid and, and ate a lot of really, really critical innings for us. But, but I think we've improved at those two positions. So I think our starters will be, our, will, will be a strength that everyone looks at. And then and the bullpen, I mean, the, um, you know, like we're just deeper. It's all, they're all veterans. We're not, you know, even Carl Edwards now, believe it or not, is a veteran. Like, you know, like the fact is that, like we, we've got guys uh, who are strike throwers, who are gonna come in in pressure situations and, um, and be ready, ready to be up to it. So I think we're good all across the board. I think uh, I'd have to say if we had a weakness, I, I think team speed might be one of our lacking <laughs> things, but I don't know if we'll steal 10 bases this year, but, uh, but team base running is more important than team speed. So anyway, I, I think we're pretty good across the board, honestly. Time for two more? Sure. Good afternoon. First question, I have two. First question is, looking at that construction picture that was up there, that was really impressive. What's plan B come opening day? <laughs> Second one, it's more about youth participation. Our, our local Little League field has a connection with, with the Cubs from the movie Rookie of the Year. It was where the Little League field were seen, oh, right? okay. were, were filmed in Westmont. I grew up on that field. My office is practically right outside of it. And it pains me to see it empty all day long during the summer. And that's happening across the country. National Sporting Goods Association just came out with new numbers that about 15 years ago, participation in youth baseball was about 17 and a half million. Today, it's at about 13 million. Uh, keeping kids involved and, and interested, and in, we hear numbers are dropping because they're going to travel baseball. Not the case, it's just across the board. Is that a concern to you? Have you gotten involved in those kinds of uh, numbers and what to do about it to keep kids involved, participating? Uh, there's a lot more opportunities out there, but you know those are things we struggle with. Yeah, the, um, that's a great question, and um, there's a, the answer is yes. It's it's something that we think about. You know what? I would also, if you, if you want to feel better. Um, the Sports Fitness Industry Association puts out a, a, a survey every year of partic youth participation. And baseball has come back very strong the last few years, like 15% in the last two years alone. So um, we're, we are seeing participation both in, in baseball and softball uh, going up, actually. And I think the other thing that you know, we got to be careful about is the actual number of kids participating in every sport has been threatened or at least challenge, and that's because, and we all have kids, you know, we all, many of us have kids, like, kids don't play more than one sport anymore after they're 11 years old. Like, you know, the fact is, kids are being asked to specialize, they, you know, they they get on the travel teams and the travel soccer coach, like, well, you can play basketball if you want, but you can't miss my four winter tryouts, my four winter workouts every week and our, and our indoor game. Or, you know, like, so, so kids are specializing more, so there are not as many kids in each sport, um, but baseball definitely had a, had a period where we, we lost share, I guess would be a word. Um, but it, it has rallied substantially. 
Now, um, what we do is we work, with, we work with Little League Baseball, we try to build more fields. We, we, we the Cubs, build more fields, and, and we try to give you know, more support to coaches and Little Leagues. Uh, what the league does, the league works with Little League Baseball to try to promote that to the extent we can. Um, so it matters to us. We want to have more kids on the field. We, uh, we certainly know that that's an important part of our future, driving more, more fan avidity over time. You know, the more kids that play, the longer they'll be. Uh, the more likely they'll be really strong baseball fans. So, um, yeah, we definitely focus on that. But, but you know, it's not like every, not like every sport's crushing it. Obviously, football is going to go through a tough time now, but, uh, but baseball's actually rallied a little bit, and hopefully we'll keep building on that. Second to last one, I think. I just want to say thank you for Joe. Absolutely yeah. love that man. And I was just curious if you were doing anything with the netting at the field. Um, yeah, so first of all, yeah, Joe's pretty special. I don't, I don't know that I know anyone with more like just natural charisma than, than Joe Madden. And he relates to all the players at their, whatever level they are, um, whether they're a veteran or just a, a rookie. He's just great at dealing with players and, and um, just a great manager, a really terrific manager. Um, with respect to the netting, yeah, we'll stretch the netting out this year. Uh, I believe we're going all the way to the end of the dugout. Um, and the logic is just that we just want to keep people safe. You know, we survey people that sit down in those sections and they don't want netting. And so we've, um, you know, we've listened to that for a long time. But it just seems like, uh, you know, that uh, it just may be the right thing to do. And but we'll, we'll try to make it as, as, as uh, least obtrusive as possible and, you know, not make it too high, you know, because so when a guy comes off the field, maybe he can flip a baseball to the crowd like, but like they do now, but um, but you know, I think you know, just you know, what is I think that uh, the teams in general are just putting up more netting now. Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion of, uh, about the efforts to speed up the game and the possibilities of the pitch clock. Yeah. So um, for those that aren't following it the closely, like the average major league baseball game used to be like two hours and twenty-five minutes, or two hours and thirty minutes. And over the last twenty years, it's kind of drifted up to about three hours. And, um, you know, and honestly, like, it is a concern of the league. I personally, when I'm walking around Wrigley Field, nobody really brings that up. You know, like, I, you know, like, you know, it's when people, like, turn on the TV and it just doesn't end. You know, I think that's when people kind of um, start to think about it a little more. But uh, we are looking at ways. And obviously, you saw that last year, uh, maybe two years ago, we put in a, a clock to get the guys on and off the field a little quick, more quickly um, this year. Uh, you know, we've, we're going to be watching players to get in and out of the batter's box a little more quickly. Uh, we're going to limit the number of mound visits. A lot of teams are, you know, uh, you know, apparently like a little bit of a stall, you know, kind of thing where they would send visitors out and just to, to get by time for bullpens to get warmed up or whatnot. Um, we're trying to keep it snappier, but, but we, we, you know, we have to work with the players too, you know, work with the union and, and see what works. Um, I mean, my, you know, the other, the other thing that's happened in the game, which isn't a rule issue, it's just the way people play, is the number of strikeouts, the number of walks, and the number of home runs keep going up every year. And so obviously those, I mean, those at bats, um, you know, they take a little longer. Guys are waiting for the right pitch. You know, one of the things guys in baseball do now that they didn't do 30 or 40 years ago is they'll take a called third strike if they know, if, you know, whether, if, if that pitch, hits that low outside corner, they know that even if they put it in play, it's an out. So they'll take their chance that that's a ball. And so you see a lot more guys striking out. And hitting coaches are like, well, look, you, know, that's a, you, know, you struck out. I get it. But even if you swung at that, you're just going to roll it over to the first baseman anyway. So if you can't get a pitch to drive, just hope it's a ball. So you know, players are you know, just adjusted to that. I mean, maybe one of the things we do at some point is kind of tighten the strike zone a little bit so that more balls get put in play. Um, but, you know, changing that is something that will be really dramatic for the players and it will take a lot of discussion. So, um, but yeah, we want to we speed up the game. Pitch clock, we do the pitch clock in the minors already. And um, the pitch clock idea, you know, it's not going into effect this year. You know, most pitchers don't have a problem with pitch clocks in terms of the time. They don't, they don't, they don't take more than 20 seconds. Um, I don't think most pitchers are in favor of a pitch clock either, and they probably just don't want to deal with one more thing to think about. But, um, uh, or if they want to take an extra 
moment between a certain pitch that they want to have the freedom to do that. Um, we'll see if pitch clock ever becomes a thing. But for now, it's focusing on getting the guys on and off the field more quickly and um, you know, making sure they just don't dawdle quite as much. And hopefully that'll um, tighten up the game somewhat. This one is not a question. It's a comment from your, one of your staff members, a message from one of your staff members. Oh, boy. Hi, Mr. Ricketts. I'm Debbie Nelson with Chicago Suburban Newspaper, The Daily Herald. And I'm pleased to be friends with Rick Hughes. And he's on the phone to let you know that the world's best grounds crew manager will have your field whipped into shape and no <laughs> Well, we do have a great team. Uh, Rick is obviously uh, one of our leaders there. Like, we do have a, a bunch of guys who are working really hard. And, and you know what? They've never let us down. Um, the only time that I've let them down was uh, a few years ago, we had uh, uh, Roger Waters of Pink Floyd do a concert at Wrigley Field. And he did The Wall. And The Wall is just involved show, as you guys might know. And it stretches from foul pole to foul pole. And, um, and we're like, well, he's gonna do the game, he's gonna do the show on Saturday, we're playing Monday. We're like, fine, that'll be plenty of time. We're doing the Monday night game, that'll be plenty of time to get it fixed. Well, to set up the wall, it takes about a week. And they put this metal track on the grass, which isn't a big problem unless it rains a couple times and gets really hot. So they pulled up that metal track, and Rick will know the story. They pulled up that metal track after the concert, and that grass wasn't just dead, it was completely rotting. And it smelled, it smelled like, a, like a farm. And um, so it was just that, 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 that. So anyway, I walked out Monday morning and I'm like, oh my God, Soriano's eyes are gonna water when he gets out here tonight to play baseball. But the grounds crew, um, very quickly, like they got out fans, they aired out what they could. They painted it to look as green as it could get. <laughs> but, um, but, uh, you know, that's a case where those guys never let me down. Sometimes I ask a little too much at times. But and on TV, it was this big stripe across our outfield. So anyway, we won't do that again. But anyway, so I know my, my time is up. I just want to say, uh, once again, it's great to be back. And uh, thanks to everybody in the room. And hope we all see you at a Cubs game this year. Thanks. Thanks for watching our video. If you have any questions, feel free to comment below. Click the subscribe button for more videos, listen and download us on SoundCloud. Visit our site at blocksnews.net and exclusivecollectibles.com for articles, news, collectibles, and help with your website, marketing, and SEO needs. Email us at info at to learn more.